overnight, the relentless holiday storm dumping even more rain across the West Coast. By air and by boat, crews across California rescuing residents caught in high flood waters. When you think of the Pacific, what comes to mind? For some, it's endless blue, the tranquil hush of fog rolling in over San Francisco Bay, or sunlit surfers cutting glassy waves along Malibu, bronzed and balanced against a horizon that feels infinite. Maybe you picture the midnight luminescence of phytoplankton lighting up the water's edge, or the towering cliffs of Big Sur blurred by sea spray. For others, it's the powerful pulse of winter storms, the ceaseless motion of tides that grind boulders into sand and reshape the coastline with a force nothing can deny. The ocean is an indomitable presence, simultaneously wild and welcoming, a source of food, leisure, and awe. It is a playground, a provider, a trade route, and a stage for calamity. For centuries, the Pacific's moods have defined the rhythm of the American West Coast. Fishing fleets rise before dawn in Astoria or Santa Barbara, their destinies tethered to the water's temperament. Ships from every continent thread through the Golden Gate, Tourists stand spellbound on windswept promontories, while families gather on crowded beaches, building castles at the edge of roaring surf. In our collective memory, the Pacific is elemental, eternal, a great backdrop, steady and vast, untroubled by generations of human striving. But what if that sense of constancy is about to disappear? What if the Pacific itself is changing, growing more unpredictable, powerful, and even hostile, right under our noses? Or are we clinging to a story of the Pacific that's already out of date? Chapter 1. Let's get oriented. To grasp the scale of what's unfolding, let's orient ourselves to the Pacific and its connection to the west coast of the United States. The U.S. West Coast stretches from the arid borderlands of Southern California at the edge of Mexico, up through the fire-prone chaparral of the Central Coast, over the misty headlands of Oregon, and into the rain-soaked reaches of Washington, all the way into British Columbia's outer islands. That's a boundary of more than 2,500 miles where ocean meets land, sometimes gently, often with violence. Some of the world's most ambitious and populous cities, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, cluster along this rim, their fortunes made and unmade by their proximity to deep water. There are smaller towns too, Crescent City battered by tsunamis, Garibaldi dependent on salmon and crab, Westport perched atop shifting sands. The Pacific Ocean itself is titanic, covering over 63 million square miles. It stretches wider than all the land masses combined, containing fabled trenches, shifting tectonic plates, and swirling gyres that shape global climate. It's the largest, deepest, and perhaps most restless body of water on Earth. Yet these figures only hint at the Pacific's true complexity. The ocean is never just a blue expanse. It's a tumult of warm and cold currents spanning vast distances, locked in perpetual motion. Atmospheric rivers, sky-borne torrents capable of carrying more water than the Amazon, arc thousands of miles, bringing drought-breaking rains or devastating floods. Submarine mountain ranges, out of sight for most, can trigger tsunamis racing toward shore at jetliner speeds. In coastal waters, Upwellings of frigid, nutrient-rich water can spark explosions of marine life, or, if currents falter, starve it. The shoreline is a study in contrasts. Wide, sandy beaches bustling with volleyball tournaments, treacherous cliffs etched with hiking trails, marshes alive with migratory birds, tangled kelp forests teeming with underwater drama. Cities and harbors stitch themselves into this landscape, their built edges always in tension with tides and storms. For the past century, Americans have prided themselves on their ability to tame, or at least predict, the Pacific's extremes. Doppler radar and weather satellites scan its skies. Commercial fleets ply its lanes guided by GPS. And a web of levees and seawalls guard against extremes. There's a shared confidence, sometimes bordering on hubris, that the Pacific is containable, if not truly controllable. Beneath daily routines, you have to ask, is the comfortable, predictable Pacific that built so many fortunes slipping away, a casualty of changes beyond even our modern reach. Chapter 2. When the Pacific Turns, What Hostility Looks Like What does it mean for an ocean to turn hostile? In one sense, the Pacific has always had a dual nature. It gives and it takes, granting seasons of bounty before snatching them back. 
But hostile doesn't mean raging surf every day, nor a single dramatic natural disaster. In reality, it's an unsettling crescendo, a series of compounding stresses and mounting surprises, hinting at a fundamental shift. Imagine, communities battered repeatedly by king tides once considered once-in-a-century events, tides that send seawater flooding streets and floating cars. Picture bluffs thought stable, undermined not only by the slow nibble of surf, but by storms whose power grows more intense. Suddenly sped up. Consider ocean water running warmer than before, sometimes several degrees above historical averages. Where once cool currents brought California its legendary fogs and thriving fisheries, now marine heat waves linger for months. Kelp forests bleach and dissolve, fish populations scatter, with once abundant anchovies and sardines declining, while predators show up far from their usual grounds. Webs of ocean life, stable for centuries, show signs of growing stress and instability. Elsewhere, floodwaters surge up rivers, bringing saltwater where only fresh belonged, forcing city planners and farmers to rework maps and expectations yearly, not once a generation. The Pacific's restlessness is echoed in the sky. More frequent and potent atmospheric rivers, sometimes breaking droughts, sometimes wreaking havoc with dangerous floods. Some years bring the opposite, relentless drought, wildfires burning right to the shoreline. These are not scenes reserved for summer blockbusters. These events are unfolding right now, from the Mexican border to Puget Sound. Viewed one at a time, they may seem like quirks, anomalies, or freak events, but together they suggest a chilling pattern. The Pacific is no longer predictable. It's becoming, in key ways, a wild card, and the warning signs are not speculation, but fact for millions. Physically, hostility is a matter of scale and unpredictability. Erosion that once took inches in a year now can claim yards or streets overnight in bad years. Marine heat waves, almost unheard of before the last decade, are now regular enough to have names, bringing ecological domino effects that reach dinner tables. Atmospheric rivers bringing record rains and floods are linked directly to ocean warming, with impacts on everything from infrastructure to insurance. Eventually, even the best mathematical models, global meteorology's pride, begin to fray. Seasons misalign, previously reliable patterns wobble, and the old certainty that this too shall pass is no longer guaranteed. Chapter 3. Warning Signs Scientists Can't Ignore Scientists, engineers, and naturalists who spend their lives with the Pacific are the first to register shifting tides, literal and metaphorical. From marine biologists testing waters for plankton to climate modelers running supercomputer simulations, the West Coast's scientific community is on the front line of detecting and predicting oceanic change. Consider water temperatures. 30 years ago, the Pacific along the coast followed familiar rhythms. Fishermen could count on upwelling seasons, kelp beds flourished, and scientists mapped whales and seabirds with confidence. Now erratic spikes, sometimes five to six degrees above normal, disrupt these patterns. Warm blobs of water stretch for hundreds of miles, depriving signature species of the cool conditions they need. Toxic algae blooms, a rare problem for generations, now regularly shutter fisheries. It's not just temperature. Along beaches and estuaries, king tides and nuisance flooding are growing more extreme. Sea levels along the west coast are rising at varying rates, and benchmarks once anticipated decades into the future are being reached in just years or months. Flooded roads and seawater near doorsteps are no longer distant threats. They are present realities. Those aerial rivers that circle the globe and pour Pacific moisture into the West Coast, meteorologists once called them Pineapple Express storms, rare and powerful. Now they are more common, and in some years, a handful can break droughts or overwhelm levees. Some of these events capture news attention. Others are already considered normal background. But scientists are watching trends that point to thresholds being crossed, ecological tipping points, climatic feedback loops, surprising shifts in plankton, fish, and rainfall. These are not future risks. Each record tide or heat wave is a data point in a rapidly transforming Pacific, a message with consequences for all who live along its margins. Which brings us to the crux. When scientists warn that the Pacific is straying from stability, shouldn't we listen with more urgency? Chapter 4. The Human Layer, Cities and Communities on Shifting Sand Beyond data and deep water, 
the most consequential changes arrive at the juncture of coast and community. Here's where the Pacific stops being abstract and becomes lived reality. Consider the iconic strands of West Coast life. Los Angeles, with its stretches of multi-million dollar homes atop bluffs, now holds community meetings not only over new developments, but over which houses must be condemned before the next winter's storms. In San Francisco, whole neighborhoods face mounting challenges as seawalls and other defenses, built for a different era, struggle to hold back today's floods. The city's financial center, sitting only a few feet above high tide, could be swamped by a single extreme surge of sea levels keep rising. In Oregon and Washington, smaller beach towns are even more precarious, often lacking the massive seawalls of larger cities. Their fate hinges on whether sandbars and forests hold against storms or the coastline is rearranged overnight. Each new winter brings fresh detours as landslides and eroding headlands reshape roads. Local officials become skilled, sometimes unwillingly, in the challenge of managed retreat, the contentious, sometimes traumatic process of giving ground back to the sea. On paper, it's a strategy. In real life, it's a painful debate over whose homes, whose memories are given up, how much compensation is fair. Infrastructure magnifies the stakes. The ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, one of the world's busiest shipping complexes, fuel national trade but occupy ground vulnerable to rising waters and subsidence. Rail lines and freeways designed for dry decades increasingly flood during heavy storms with ripple effects on supply chains. Further inland, hidden threats grow. In California's Great River Deltas, saltwater pushes upstream, tainting groundwater vital for cities and farms alike. Agriculture, everything from grapes to almonds to lettuce, depends on reliable water. And as supplies grow brackish or uncertain, entire economies feel the strain. The choice grows clearer but not easier or accept a new configuration of the region. When do we admit, publicly and honestly, that the ground we built on is as temporary as the patterns of tide and storm? Chapter five, the forgotten elements, ecology under siege. It's natural to focus on cities and money, but the subtler, deeper crisis unfolds among the wild species that once thrived by the Pacific's steady clock. Kelp forests off California, those underwater jungles that shelter hundreds of species are a prime example. Where colder currents once let them flourish, rising temperatures and mass die-offs of key predators like sea stars have let sea urchin infestations devour kelp at unprecedented rates. In some places, forests have vanished in just a few years, sending food webs into disarray. These losses echo throughout the ecosystem. Fish stocks fluctuate. Seabirds like common murres and puffins desert nesting cliffs that were once crowded with chicks as food grows scarce. Sea otters, icons of California's coast, range further in search of surviving kelp. Meanwhile, Dungeness crab, culturally and economically essential, are sidelined by closures caused by domoic acid, a marine toxin that's become more prevalent with warming. Salmon runs, long challenged by dams and diversions, now face a gauntlet of drought, overheated streams, and sudden storm-driven setup. Perhaps most insidious is the unpredictability. Shifts in temperature one year can collapse anchovy populations. Sudden changes in upwelling move the crisis somewhere else. Adaptive management, changing quotas, closing fisheries, rotating protection zones, can feel like running a race with the finish line always moving. When the structure of the ocean itself, the temperature, timing of currents, chemistry, wobbles, all life that depends on it, from plankton to people, is forced into uncertainty. Chapter 6 Chasing Control Engineering versus the Elements The Western coastal story is much about faith in engineering, about remaking nature into something manageable. From the bridges of San Francisco Bay to beachfront fortifications and the levees protecting California's delta, the prevailing belief has long been that whatever challenge nature offers, human ingenuity can match it. That legacy continues. Cities pour money into higher seawalls. San Francisco raises barriers along the Embarcadero. Los Angeles experiments with living shorelines that blend marshes and oyster beds with artificial defenses. In Seattle and Tacoma, stormwater systems are redrawn to handle the new normal of record-setting rain. But for every defense, the Pacific throws up another problem. Seawalls, even at their best, can worsen wave impacts elsewhere. Temporary barriers must be rebuilt after every major event. Insurance grows pricier, and talk of retreat replaces grand proposals. 
Gradually, even the best engineering reveals itself as temporary, a holding action against something vaster and more persistent. The hardest conversations, when and how to give up land to the sea, where to invest in rebuilding, how to keep communities cohesive, move from hypothetical to urgent. Should we build higher, move back, or learn to live differently with water's cycles and shifting boundaries? The deeper question looms. Will we keep trying to outbuild the ocean or learn finally to live with its rhythms? Chapter seven, nerves on edge, policy, warnings, and the friction of readiness. Warnings abound. Federal, state, and local agencies accumulate mountains of data, convene expert panels, and draft adaptation plans. But as the Pacific's transformation accelerates, the difference between planning and real readiness is stark. American emergency planning historically tilted toward hurricanes on the Gulf or Atlantic, tornadoes in the Midwest, and wildfires in the dry west. The Pacific's new threats, a ceaseless interplay of tides, deluges, sea level rise, and habitat collapse, are less telegenic, but just as impactful. How do you rally the public when the crisis unfolds in slow, relentless increments, with no clear before and after? Policy debates often stall on seawall heights and insurance rates, while bridges, aqueducts, and other infrastructure still rest on outdated climate assumptions. After extreme floods or storms, responses sometimes lag, not for lack of information, but because frameworks and protocols haven't kept up with reality. On the national level, adaptation budgets lag behind needs. Efforts to move people out of harm's way struggle for funding and run into legal barriers. Every year, the pace of change runs ahead of bureaucracy, and of political will. Public attention flares after disasters but fades quickly, leaving long-term action incomplete. As disaster memories recede, urgency wanes, but the Pacific's restlessness only grows. This is the core challenge, an ocean in accelerating motion, policy stuck in slow gear, readiness always a step behind. Chapter eight, a future unwritten, living with a hostile Pacific. Sand slipping away, cliffs tumbling, kelp forests going silent, king tides blurring the known boundaries of land and sea. Scientists' warnings are sharper, and millions living on the West Coast have a new, uneasy sense that the Pacific, their sustaining backdrop, has shifted and not in their favor. What's to be done when our basic relationship with a force as large as the Pacific turns fraught? There are answers, but none easy or universal. Some cities invest in new defenses while others quietly plan for retreat. Some leaders build supply reserves or create regional task forces. Others rewrite zoning laws. Fishermen change their seasons or give up boats held for generations. Families contemplate whether to rebuild or leave. Sometimes communities coordinate, scientists share data, cities borrow good ideas, regions experiment with living with water in place of always fighting it. Yet the Pacific's timeline is longer than any emergency plan. Its effects will unfold over lifetimes. The story of the ocean's turning is only beginning, and the outcome undecided. But this much is certain. The Pacific is no backdrop, and no mere scenery for human ambition. It is a force, both giving and taking. Our collective ability to face this, with clear eyes, imagination, humility, and resolve, will determine what the West Coast becomes for generations yet to come. As you stand at the water's edge, the question resounds, is the West Coast truly ready? Can any coast ever claim such readiness? Or does the ocean, vast, unpredictable, enduring, always have the final word?